Hello, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of the Emerald Planet and Emerald Planet TV. We come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, the technology, services, and products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And as we have a planet of 9 billion people by 2038 and possibly 12 to 13 billion by the end of this century, how are we going to be able to take care of all these people on planet Earth? And that's what Emerald Planet's all about. We come to you looking at the solutions, the best practices from around the globe as we create the Emerald Planet. Hello, welcome to the Emerald Planet. We're making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And seeing the long-term impacts of climate change, Looking around the globe, we're talking about water, we're talking about air and soil, and how do we balance these three to make sure that we're feeding the globe. As we go to a population of 9 billion people by 2038, possibly 12 to 13 billion by the end of the century, how we're going to be able to feed and provide the fuel and fiber for all of these individuals in doing a way that we can sustain the environment. And actually, we're interviewing someone who's doing all of this and has been for almost a decade. This is Keith Olinger. He's the owner of Porchview Farm. And we're going to be talking about enhancing soil health with water management through key lines. And we're going to find out what this key line is all about. Keith, welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, say, give us a little overview of Porchview Farm. And then let's get into these key lines. I'm very interested to see this. Uh, well, we've been farming here in this location for about eight years now. Um, we, uh, we have cattle and sheep and hogs. We have ducks and geese and chickens and rabbits and honeybees. And uh, we, uh, we do all this. Uh, I'm a full-time farmer. Uh, my wife and two daughters are here with me as well. And during the week, we, we, we do the best we can managing all the different systems. We've planted over 15,000 trees. I stopped counting when we hit 15,000. My goodness gracious, that's absolutely incredible. But looking at uh, your pasture lands and your farm, tell us what we're looking at from this bird's eye view. And uh, we're starting to see, I think, the emergence of these key lines that you're going to tell us about. But just give us an overview of the property we're looking at right now. Well, yes, as you can see, we are a large rectangle. There's a, a small pipe stem driveway that comes in from the main road. We sit about maybe 400 feet off the main road behind another farmer's field that we don't own that field. Um, you can see that uh, the blue dot there is over our home. And as you come up the driveway, which is off to the left there, um, that's our what we call our shop. We have woodworking and, and metalworking equipment in there and our freezer for our, our meat. And then further towards the center of the property there in the, in the lower center, that's our main agricultural buildings. Uh, we've added a building in there and towards the, uh, if you can see the indicator of north is the red arrow and white is the south arrow on the southern side of the property there, uh, you'll see six what looks like uh, ditches or rows that kind of meander their way through the field. Mm -hmm. And those are the key lines that we're talking about. Okay, fantastic. Now, looking at this uh, highlighted, uh, we're seeing a blue line off to our right. And then, of course, we have the, the green lines, which I think are part of your key lines. So tell us how this mix and match uh, on your property. So the, the green lines there in this photo actually indicate trees that we've planted, um, which are part of the living fence system that we employ the green lines labeled one through six they're t closest to us um, those are the key lines that that we put in that we installed and so the you can't see it because there's no contour uh scale in this photo but they the the main part starts in a in a valley and then it drops one percent as it extends back out to the ridges mm -hmm. Now, looking at that, why is that important, the pitch, as far as the soil is concerned? 
Well, the nature, you know, gravity, as rain falls, anything that starts to run off your land will head towards the low spots from a high to a low spot. It'll concentrate in the valley and then run off from there. As it, as it gathers, it gains speed and momentum, and then you can start to pick up soil and have erosion. So mm -hmm. what we're trying to do is we're trying to take that water and push it back from where it wants to concentrate in the valleys mm -hmm. and push it back out to the ridges. That 1% slope is the, the, the lowest percentage that you can have that water will actually flow, mm -hmm. and we want to slow it down. So we're, we're gently pushing it back out to the ridges to give it one more chance to soak in so that it goes back and it replenishes the groundwater cycle. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at this, and I'm going to ask this question right now, why is it so important that we capture this water, sequester, i.e. put it in the ground, and then have it there for future use? Why not just, you know, use irrigation or wait for the rains? Why is it so important to capture the storm water in advance of actually even needing it? Well, there's there's a few reasons. I, I mentioned erosion. Um, I'm I'm on our soil conservation district board of supervisors, and we're always concerned about soil conservation. So we 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 know for a fact our our farms have lost huge amounts of topsoil over the time that we've been farming. But mm -hmm. it's more important than that, and that moisture is incredibly important for your soil microbes and the life that's in the soil to complete its life cycle. It mm -hmm. needs moisture. And so by increasing the soil health and getting the water back in the cycle, we help the microbes balance the nutrient levels. They, they will then break down, you know, grasses and, and, and wood and other things that, that mm -hmm. fall into the soil. Which you and call the biomass. That's right. And they also mm -hmm. process the minerals that are already existing there. So by having that moisture, it allows that life to, to, provide its function that it normally would do. And the whole thing about what we see above, we get excited about it's human beings, of course, and the sure. cattle, you know, and you went through the list of all the animals you have on your property, but actually there's billions of these microbes in the soil. And if they're unhappy or unhealthy, uh, they're going to make everything above on top of the ground unhealthy and unhappy. Is that's that correct? Right. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So we need to keep them uh, going. Looking at uh, this process, it looks fairly simple, uh, but yet it's very sophisticated in the layout and design. So let's talk about the simplicity. You have this uh, front end loader, you're pulling up the earth, and then the complexity. Why are we doing this? Well, so so again, we we looked at the topography of the farm and we found what's called the key point of this valley. So um, it's the highest, most economical place to store water on our particular farm. And so we started there and we, we took what looks like a pair of dividers that you'd use with pencil and paper. And it had a five foot base and we walked it across the property on the contour. And every time we did it 20 times, which would equal hundred feet, mm -hmm. we would put a marker in one foot downhill from that spot. And by mm -hmm. the time we were done with the field, we had a long line of flags. And so then I drove the field with a, a single bottom mold bore plow, which was the previous picture that you, you showed, mm -hmm. that we followed that contour of flags and we put in, we turned the soil downhill, which created the ditch. And then the picture that we have here is I'm coming in just slightly uphill from the ditch and I'm taking a scoop out of soil and then flipping it onto the downhill side, which will become the berm. So mm -hmm. that swale, that ditch that we're creating there will be what will capture the water. And then that slope helps to direct it from the key point in the center of the farm back out mm -hmm. to the ridges. Yeah, well, that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, looking at this, uh, a closer view, but we also have the other key lines in the back. So what you're doing then is you are replicating this across this property uh, so that the water then in between with its uh, rain or even maybe flood water, then it's gonna be caught somewhere, go into this key line, and then that's gonna become a part of the water table. Is that the that's right. simplistic there's, view of this? There's about 48 feet of forage, so the, the grass, in between each of the key lines. Mm -hmm. And then the key line system, the, the swale and berm, and ultimately we fenced in the five feet on top and planted mm -hmm. trees. That area there is the, 
the the area that the, the in the green in the grass that's where the livestock will graze mm -hmm. now this is a very pretty view right here but this uh, looks like this is now actually taking hold i don't want to say taking root that's too much of a pun uh, <laughs> but uh, actually what it is the grass starts to cover over uh, all these uh, ditches and the swells correct that's correct yes and so what we had done here we had actually the, the it was it was a learning process the the first round i had just used to plow and it made for a fairly rough go so i tried rototilling on both sides the uphill the center and the downhill side to make it easier to move the soil it did make it easier to move the soil however what i had inadvertently done was expose some canada thistle seeds when i rototilled it <laughs> and then that created a lot of problems later on dealing with that since we are essentially we don't spray to manage the the weeds right. Uh, so I would recommend anyone trying to do this today. Uh, you may want to be careful if you're going to rototill. Um, it does make it easier to do the work, but then later on, you got to deal with the weeds. Yeah, I mean, dealing with weeds uh, long term, that is a great pain and suffering to do that. Yeah, uh, we avoid again, looking we, we at we the key line. Yeah. Uh, tell us about this. And it looks like you have some tracks going in this. Does this allow the water to permeate the soil at a faster rate or is this just in the development stage? Well, this was this was right after um, we had flipped everything over. And at this point, I was going through with a shovel at the bottom and cleaning up to, to make it more uniform. It turns out I really didn't need to do that. After you got the first rain, it cleaned itself up. Um, but yeah, this th what, what happens here after this is you'd put seed down uh, because in the case that you would get a, a large ra rainstorm or several large rainstorms, you don't want it to blow out your berm. Mm -hmm. right. uh, so this was right before we added some seed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now this uh, shows you uh, actually capturing the water. So this must have been an incredible rainstorm you had. And of course, we're getting more and more of these. And also the intensity of these, they're now calling these uh, rain bombs or cloud bombs. Yeah. What happened in this photo was actually it was it was early in the spring and the ground hadn't quite thawed yet. And we had mm -hmm. an event that could have gone rain or could have gone snow. And in this case, it ended up being rain. Um, and so the ground wasn't able to absorb the, the water at this point because it was still frozen. But it, it created such a nice view of what we were trying to explain to people um, that happens, we, we, we took a picture of it. I, I think this is absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Now, looking at this, we're about running out of time. So what are we seeing in this? And I know this uh, somehow relates to your trees, correct? Uh, yes, so what you're seeing here is the, the swale is actually on, on the left side. Mm -hmm. The berm is where the trees are planted there. And then what happens is we planted the trees on top of the berm. So these are actually gonna be production trees that will produce nuts. These are, these are chestnut trees in this picture. They'll produce nuts for our livestock. And so what mm -hmm. happens is as the rain runs off, if any does, it actually is watering the trees, the roots of the trees so that we don't have to actually physically water. Yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. And this is a, a scene, and I think we'll go out on this. I believe this is the last photograph. Now, what do you see for this type of agriculture, these using key lines among uh, farmers, say in Maryland or across the Eastern seaboard over the next five, 10 or 15 years? And we gotta be quick. I, I think it holds a lot of promise, uh, but there's some some interruptions in the legislation and stuff that make it a little a little harder to implement. Well, uh, looking at this, this is a beautiful view, and we're going to come back to this uh, in the future. And thank you for being with us as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet. Thank you so much.